On the 22nd of November, 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated as his motorcade made its way to the Dallas Trade Mart. There has been an attempt on the life of President Kennedy. It is true that our President, Kelly what if technology had advanced so much so as to allow JFK, on the centenary of his birth, to finally deliver the hugely important trademark speech? As part of the Times Find Your Voice campaign, we had to review 831 JFK speeches and interviews and create a database of 116,777 phonetic sound units split into 233,554 half phones. To blend small speech units together, it helps to have very consistent data. For JFK, this was a major challenge. It was almost as if each recording was in a different environment and of a different quality so combinations of sounds were selected and smoothed together by months of painstaking sound engineering, allowing us to finally hear the trademark speech delivered in JFK's own voice. In a world of complex and continuing problems, in a world full of frustrations and irritations, America's leadership must be guided by the lights of learning and reason, or else those who confuse rhetoric with reality and the plausible with the possible will gain the popular ascendance with their seemingly swift and simple solutions to every world problem. His unspoken trademark speech was ahead of its time, with vital advice for today's leaders on freedom, power, wisdom, and restraint. Welcome, Alan. And thank you very much for flying in this morning. I know you've had a bit of a journey. A <laughs> um, So before we get into discussing the great creative, it would be great if you could give us a little bit more background about yourself. Because as Pete mentioned, you're the most awarded creative in Ireland, I believe. Well, I don't think anybody's going to check it. So um, <laughs> yes. I thought I was going to be pretty safe. Uh, uh, we just printed plane. it in everything. No, oh, great. <laughs> great. Yeah, no, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this is obviously a project that you work with for the Times. Yeah. Um, where did the inspiration come from? I know you have a bit of personal connection uh, with the Kennedy. Well, there's kind of two two strains to it. One was uh, uh, my colleague Paul uh, Paul Hughes was talking to the editor of the Times Ireland edition, who's Richie Oakey, and Ireland has a lot of tech companies based um, based there, and a lot of European HQs in Dublin, but. Uh, the Times, certainly the Irish edition, had never really done a tech story. They never really covered that uh, part of it. So um, they were talking and uh, they got me involved. And, um, and I'm a Kennedy nut. Uh, uh, my mother is a Kennedy. When I was a kid growing up, we had JFK's photo on the wall. Um, we, had, we, we looked into two uh, kind of, you know, uh, it's that program, uh, Who Do You Think You Are? You know, where they look back at family trees and stuff like that. So we thought, you know, maybe there's a good chance that we were related to JFK. So the first, the first investigation came back to say, um, yeah, I think, I think there's maybe a distance connection there. Uh, and the second one came back, absolutely not. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. So we're, we've chosen to believe uh, the first one. So um, that, was, that was the connection to Kennedy. I've been a nut. Um, um, and I, I just I watch a lot of documentaries. And there was one I saw, which was, um, I think it was a CNN one, which was The Last Days, Last Days of JFK, something like that. Um, and they said this thing that I haven't heard before. The narrator said um, when he was going through Dealey Plaza uh, on that fateful day, uh, he was, they mentioned he was on his way to the Dallas Trade Mart to give a speech. I'd never thought about, I'd say, like a lot of people, I'd never thought about where he was going that day, maybe just to the airport or I don't know. Um, so I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. So, a quick search, I found the speech. The speech, like any Kennedy speech, is amazing. Um, not just for 1963, but hopefully you've got um, to hear, hear that clip. And the, you know, there's, he could give that speech today, and it would be quite apt. So, uh, so I found the speech. The speech is amazing. 
Um, and then I started to think, you know, uh, could, could we could we make it possible? What if? Um, so yeah, went back to went back to the agency, talked to the guys, um, and our, our search for a company started. So we looked into all sorts of tech uh, companies, and eventually we found one in Scotland called Seraproc. Um, and what Seraproc do is very really interesting work. They um, they do a lot of work with uh, motor neurons disease. So when um, if you have let's say early diagnosis, what they can do is they can get you into the studio. They can record hours of your speech, um, uh, so that when you know, sadly, when, when a motor neurons disease sufferer loses their voice, which is a huge part of their personality, they can continue to communicate with their own voice. So Stephen Hawking would obviously be the, the, the most famous um, uh, you know, sufferer of that horrible disease, um, and he had to use that very robotic voice, um, which in the end, I think he, he wanted to, uh, he didn't want to drop it, he wanted to keep it. Um, so anyway, so that's what they're involved in. Um, so then we started talking to them, and we said, okay, what if you use that technology? Obviously, we can't, we don't have hours and hours of, of, of JFK, or we can't get, we certainly can't get JFK into a, in a studio anytime soon. So what if we went back and we used old recordings, old, old, footage, or old recordings of speeches? Um, could we do that? Could we, could we um, allow him to give his final speech? And they said, uh, we don't know. Uh, we haven't a clue, uh, but we'll we'll try and find out. So it went from there. And I imagine the quality of the audio must have been a real challenge um, it, yeah. compared to the digital stuff that we now have available. Yeah. So you, with a motor neurons disease or or uh, suffer, you can go into the studio and the quality is is immaculate. You know, it's, and it's consistent, which is hugely important. Um, but with JFK, as you can imagine, some of his speeches were on you know the presidential campaign where he was you know projecting to. A, to a room or to an outdoor uh, gathering, and then other recordings were for you know radio interviews and um, his weekly radio presidential address. So it was you know some were close to the mic, some were whispered, yeah. some were projecting, some quality is terrible, some is okay. Um, so that was a real issue. And this formed part of the Times' ambition to bring new perspectives mm -hmm. to the news, and we have another video um, to show. I think. <coughs> Um, but this is where you went back and you actually played the recording to a lady who was meant to be present at the speech. Um, and I think this really brings home the idea of bringing new perspectives. And also, I think we have a real challenge on making AI feel real and show how it can impact people. And I think this video is such a great opportunity to show the impact it does have. It was November 22nd, uh, 1963, pretty fall day in Dallas after the rain stopped. There was an odd feeling that it, there, there was a stillness to the room or something, but something was up, you felt. Suddenly the press ran out for no reason at all. So we knew obviously something was up, never thinking what, was, what it really was. in this generation are by destiny rather than choice the watchman on the walls of world freedom it gave me chills it really did um, just to hear his voice again and anybody who hears this speech will be so compelled by listening to it to the bitter end and that we may achieve in our time and for all time the ancient vision of peace on earth goodwill toward men I think he gave the country dignity. It was that optimism and the hope for America. And uh, he, oh gosh, 
Some people say, well, that's too idealistic, but you need a little of that. Reaction, which I expect you were hoping for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was it like meeting Jerry? Uh, I sadly I never got to meet Jerry, um, uh, but I did talk to her uh, a lot um, on the phone. She's an amazing one. Um, so uh, yeah, her family um, were there on the day, just waiting for for JFK to arrive when it started. The news started seeping through. So for her to hear it all those years later, um, I think it's just. Uh, quite emotional, certainly for her. Another interesting um, uh, reaction to it was um, Daniel Brown. Daniel Brown was uh, working for the US State Department, so he was based in Dallas, so he knew a lot about uh, what was going on in Dallas on, uh, in that time. And he wrote the speech uh, with JFK. Uh, so his daughter, sadly he died a couple of years ago, but his daughter lives in England. Uh, Lisa Brown, and she was listening to, I was it this morning on Radio 4, mm -hmm. and they covered the, the speech, and that speech was on her wall at home growing up as a kid, and, to, and still today. So um, she was blown away to hear the words that her dad wrote all those years ago, <coughs> finally get voiced, I suppose, so it was amazing. And do you think, from an advertising perspective and a creative perspective, and I know this got a lot of coverage within, you know, not only national news but the trades, I was reading up on the drama campaign, um, do you think this has applicable learnings for other brands um, in terms of bringing voice to life? And obviously there's a lot we can now do with visual uh, replications of people and celebrities. Do you think this is something that advertising can look to replicate, or is it, does it feel like a one-off? Definitely a one-off for certainly for us. Um, this was this was coming from a place where you know um, you know there was a couple of JFK nuts who who found a story and wanted to bring to life, and it was very much a story rather than a traditional advertising kind of campaign. This was very much editorial. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's a one-off for us, and I don't know I don't know where it will go, this sort of technology will go in advertising terms, I think it's, um, uh, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of watch outs, I think, um, to use it in traditional advertising terms, um, but that's why there's advertising standards uh, to look after all of that, so for us, definitely a one-off. Absolutely. And to broaden out a little bit further in AI and just general use within creative and within advertising, um, I think we ask ourselves a lot as an industry, is there, you know, can programmatic and creative work together? Yes, they can. Um, but also, you know, can AI and creative just work in this way where you clearly use AI to enhance the creativity of people? Do you think there's going to be a potential where, you know, in five, ten years, AI is really churning out creative? I think um, Lynette had the stat with 20% of content is already being created by AI. Do you think that's going to be a risk of the creative industry? I don't see AI taking over <coughs> the creative aspect of it. I think you're still going to need humans to 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 come up with ideas, um, uh, and certainly AI can enhance those ideas. It's like there's other great examples. Um, one from a couple of years ago, which was the next Rembrandt, where uh, they taught. A, basically a painting machine, mm -hmm. the strokes that Rembrandt would use and the style and the, the, um, the quantity of paint in a, in a particular brush and they created um, the next Rembrandt, it's absolutely amazing. Another application was, um, uh, it was for book signing, so they taught a machine to sign the, uh, the uh, handwriting of, let's say, James Joyce and, uh, Samuel Beckett, so you could buy your James Joyce book and you could have it signed, uh, in, like, yeah, have a great weekend, it's James Joyce. You know? <laughs> so, so I think from the ideas point of view, you'll still need, uh, you'll see, still need humans, but the possibilities are endless after that for you. Fantastic, and um, I don't know if we have any other questions from the audience. 
I mean, I think for me, what is really incredible about this campaign is that you've taken something which is so abstract, and I'm not a JFK nut, but the thought of reading 20 pages of speech sounds quite hard going. Um, so I think it, it's a really nice example of showing how AI can bring things to life in a way that we couldn't have thought about five years ago. And to have something which isn't one of these you know, Siri, very robotic voices, or I don't know if anyone drives here, but when you have the sat nav telling you street name, and it sounds like the weirdest pronunciation you've ever heard of your street road. Um, you know, something which sounds like a person is hugely powerful. But as you said, there are limitations around the standards, and there was some uh, press around Google's deep face, um, recreating celebrities and recreating um, people, which obviously this technology needs to be careful of. But thank you so much for coming thank in. You. Thank you.